Brooklyn Independent Television. Caught in the Act is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Coming up, the art and architecture of Thomas Laser. It is uh, first and foremost a contribution to, uh, to our culture. Progressive jazz composer and double bassist Michael Bates in rehearsal. Out covering life on the streets with photojournalist Corky Lee. Just do your thing. And a new collector's club that makes things a little easier for working artists. It's been good. It's, you know, a few pieces of mine are out there and the artists get these monthly checks. They're all caught in the act, art in Brooklyn. I'm Thomas Leser. I'm an architect, originally from Frankfurt, Germany. I studied architecture in Germany. My parents were architects. I came to New York through studying here at Cooper Union. Started my own office in 1989. We're here in my office, Leser Architecture, in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Architecture is a cultural production, and as such, uh, we have responsibility not just to the client, but also to the city, to the environment, to the general public. So it's not just you know, an architect expressing him or herself, um, or not just an architect fulfilling economic or technical requirements. It is, uh, first and foremost, a contribution to, uh, to our culture. The, this, the ramp, how we're dealing with this on the inner edge now, we're not architects with a particular style, we're architects with a you know, particular kind of uh, message and content. What ties our projects together is that they all aim to reread a kind of status quo. The Helix Hotel, for example, has a lot of aspects of reinvent the hotel type, which is, which is typically uh, corridors stacked on top of each other. We wanted to bring this idea of hotel more into a relationship to an urban condition. That to occupy a hotel room is like um, occupying a house in a city along a street. The idea was developed that the hotel should actually be a kind of continuous loop, a helix, where you, you basically walk along the corridors like as if you're in a street. In the uh, iBeam project, iBeam Atelier for New Media Art, uh, it was important to understand that media art does not require uh, walls like a convention museum where you hang a painting but projections can be on walls and floors and this idea of seamlessness and continuity of space um, so we developed this the floor the wall the, and the ceiling being continuous surface and therefore you have these kind of soft edges in this museum we were sort of asked to participate in the competition for the Museum of the Moving Image, which we subsequently won, which was a very interesting project um, as we, together with the client, laid out a kind of vision for the future of the museum moving from film to digital media. We have a video amphitheater that uh, as you walk from the ground floor up into the second floor, you, you actually coming off the stair as if you're stepping out of the screen into the audience space. The integration of media technology into the actual architecture as well as a kind of conceptual understanding of the relationship of film and architecture is, is key to the project. The Museum of the Moving Image is sort of a very interesting sort of phenomenon, example. I've talked to a lot of people in Astoria who, who said it changed their life to suddenly have this kind of institution um, as a public building of this quality in their neighborhood is something they had never sort of thought possible. Um, um, and at the same time, people who never would, you know, leave Manhattan happen to end up in, in, in this museum, you know, were like, like shocked to realize that the world, there is a world outside of Manhattan. Our work is international. We have an international reputation. Uh, we work as far away as Bangkok, we work in Moscow, we work in uh, Abu Dhabi. It's very exciting to you know, work with it in these sort of extremely different locations. The context for each project is so different that it also, you know, the, the starting point is quite different every time.
sometimes it's very clear one has an idea that um, seems to be the right idea and, and other times it's sort of uh, a lot of analysis and kind of experimentation that's required to, to get to the right solution. Um, we also we probably need to eliminate these angled pieces as well. Recently we were asked uh, to, to participate in a competition for the uh, Polytechnic Museum in Moscow, which is an amazing museum. Part of the competition was to enclose two courtyards, which we proposed to enclose with a, with a, um, with a space, actually, rather than just a roof. Uh, we're proposing uh, glass galleries that, um, that is kind of as if you float over the museum. Most of our work are cultural institutions, performing arts centers, museums. We also do uh, residential projects. Uh, we are here in, in Brooklyn involved in two projects. One is the uh, Pier 1 Hotel. The key thing here is that this is, has an interior park. It's basically an idea where the, the, the park is taken in, in, to the inside and therefore is accessible uh, year-round. One of the really exciting projects we're doing here in Brooklyn is uh, the, the Strand Theatre, um, uh, which houses two institutions, Brick Media House and uh, Urban Glass. Brick involves uh, a theatre, gallery, a television studio, um, which is a very exciting program, and Urban Glass is a glass blowing facility, which, you know, which is in stark contrast uh, to the, to the theatre program. Um, but both have m public missions. An essential part was to make it, make both those institutions open to the public, to make the building, which is a very closed old, existing old building, to open it up as much as possible. Our work can influence and change uh, the world around you. There is a real impact. It's not just like another building. People actually uh, develop a real attachment and a real relationship to architecture. My name is Michael Bates and I am a double bassist and composer. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, originally from Vancouver, Canada. I moved to New York uh, about 10 years ago, um, largely to pursue a career in playing the bass and writing music and, and playing uh, with a lot of the amazing musicians that live in this city. One of the big focuses for me and one of the most rewarding aspects of being a musician for me is composing and writing my own music. Uh, I have five CDs out under my name and I've played on lots of, of others. You know, at times bass players are in demand so I'm lucky that way. I've focused on getting my, my band out all over the world and every year I try to, to get to Europe and, and tour at least twice. I have a band uh, that has toured for a long time called Outside Sources. We've done, you know, like been to Europe Belgium, Switzerland, Germany. I was really lucky that last year I got to go to China and Hong Kong and Korea and I toured with uh, some French musicians there. It's been, I've been really lucky. I've managed to, to, to see a lot of the world largely through playing the bass. It's been great. I just put out a new album. It's called Acrobat, music for and by Dmitry Shostakovich. It's on Sunnyside Records, including me, five musicians um, that are, are, are really incredible and I think um, some of the best players in, in the world, in my opinion. Tom Rainey on drums, Chris Speed on saxophone and clarinet, Russ Johnson on trumpet, and uh, Russ Lossing playing Fender Rhodes and piano. Um, it's a tribute of sorts to one of my musical heroes, Dmitry Shostakovich who is a, com a Russian classical composer who died um, in the early uh, 1970s. We do just one piece of his on the album. Now, that's the music by Shostakovich. It's called The Dance of Death. It's the fourth movement of the piano trio in E minor. The music that we recorded is, are largely my own compositions. 
Uh, I spent a lot of time studying his music and taking sounds and melodies that might have been written by him or in his style and then wrote pieces for jazz quintet. But even the, even the piece that we did of his is largely through uh, my own filter and the filter of the musicians in the band. So it doesn't sound very classical music you know, like. It's, he's been an influence of mine for a long time. I kind of feel like in some ways I could have called all my last records music for it by Dmitry Shostakovich. So I, in, in some ways this is the one that I decided to just be you know, upfront and honest about it and be very clear about where my influences lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, the so I'm kind of just going for like stuff that we already have together, most of us. And and we'll go to a piano solo. Just time no changes, piano solo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Emerging artists getting out of school, I think that you know the most important thing is to work on your craft and have a clear idea of what it is you're looking for. And that easy to say, not always easy easy to find. You have to play as many gigs as you can. You have to play with as many people as you can. You have to listen, and you have to be clear about what it is you're after. So then, so, then so a couple of solos. Yeah. And then uh, and then we come back to B. So you got one, two, three. Go on. Ba da ba da ba da ba da. Okay. One, two, one. I think um, it's very easy to be to think you're busy because you're playing lots of sessions or whatever. But you have a sort of a long-term idea of the of, of what you're trying to put out there. I'd say probably the number one thing is write your own music because I think that's where your identity will come from. You know, the standards and music from for, that is part of what has made up the jazz canon is essential. It's so important, and it's where all the the ideas sort of stem from. But we also have to look to the future and write and express ourselves. And that's how we're gonna end. In the future, I'm just kind of hoping it's an extension of what I'm doing now. You know, ideally, it would be great to be able to do, what, do the things I'm doing and have just a more immediate level of success or you know, opportunities to, to take it on the road and make it easier. Like, you know, at, at sort of when you're at, a, at the beginning stages or, or in the early stages of a career, you have to work hard for every aspect, which I like. I don't mind too much, but it would be nice after a certain amount of time for there to be interest in what you're doing enough that you'd say, okay, I have a new record, I have this new band, and I'm gonna go on the road, and people say yes. Or, I mean, imagine this for an artist, having people come and ask you to go and do things. <laughs> of the film, you always have to load up. 36 shots to a roll. But I'd rather do it this way. This way I can keep my eye on the action. This is our all-time favorite. And don't look at the little monitor on my camera. Song begins like this. A lot of times when you look the at the camera, you miss some action. Over the, coal mines of the smokestack seems so high. And I've been practicing this craft of social documentary and uh, photojournalism for the last 40 years. I work in Brooklyn, I sleep in Queens, and I spend my time in Manhattan. So it's kind of like a three borough commute. I became a self-taught photographer, but I, I think the seed was planted by the time I was in junior high school. Because that was the first time that I read that Chinese you know, completed the railroad. So in every uh, social studies history book, there's that uh, famous photograph of the two locomotives facing each other and all these people uh, in front of the locomotives. So I figured, well, if the Chinese built the railroad, you know, let me go see how many uh, Chinese there were. Looked at the history book, still not a single other Chinese. I said, you know, so if you read about something and you don't see it, 
then where are they? I realized that uh, I was not good in chemistry, not good in math. I had a, a better understanding of social studies. Basically, I wound up working in a social uh, service organization after I got out of college. I used photography uh, in the Lower East Side to document the uh, deplorable housing conditions that were pretty rampant. So I took before and after photographs of the conditions. So with these photographs, I would go to the next building uh, or the next tenant group and I could show them you know, what had uh, taken place. Just do your thing. I come to this uh, event uh, on an annual basis and I see a lot of people that, that I recognize that I've probably photographed in the past. Photojournalism, you don't script things, okay? It's not like uh, infotainment. When people were using film, uh, there's a term called photographic proof, okay? That meant that you really couldn't change the photograph, you know, once it was recorded on film. At the end of 1974, there was a uh, case of uh, alleged police brutality. Uh, these two plainclothes uh, officers came into a bar in Chinatown called the Jade Chalet. They got into a, a discussion and the discussion led into an argument. So I heard it on the radio uh, when I got up in the morning, it was around 7 a.m. in the morning. I picked out the papers, I, I read it in the New York Times and the Daily News, but there were no photographs. I said, well, I know where the restaurant uh, bar is, so I'm going to go down there and see what I can do. And while I was taking photographs, chief of detectives showed up and asked me for my uh, police ID, you know, press pass. And at that time, I didn't have a press pass. So I basically uh, lied through my teeth. The detective says, if I see you again and you don't have your press ID, I'm going to bust you. The very following year, April, uh, uh, and then also in May, I photographed a police brutality demonstration. So while they were marching, um, I took a photograph of a police officer that swung and hit a, a demonstrator on the head. So the front page photograph shows uh, this guy bleeding profusely from the forehead. He's holding his forehead and there are two police officers on his side and they're coming towards the camera just before the uh, fellow was struck with a billy club. I ran down the sidelines like a wide receiver would and did a, a button hook and then came back into the center. So I got this wide angle photograph. Uh, I was really fortunate because back then they didn't have uh, autofocus cameras. But uh, you, you set uh, the camera at f stop f8 and at uh, 10 feet, so everything from 5 feet to infinity is in focus. You got a biopic going on. Uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> People here uh, tell me that they really like uh, one photograph or another in my exhibit. Uh, and then I would ask, well, why'd you happen to like that? He says, well, I, I just like the, the look on the uh, Chinese fireman. He looked like he had a, a thousand year, yard stare and he was uh, really committed to uh, his job as a New York City fireman. And as it turns out, there's only like two or three Chinese American firemen in all of New York City. So when I think when you don't see something that's really common, you know, visually, on an intellectual or emotional level, and then you see something and say, wow, you know, uh, it gives hope to young kids that, you know, they can say to themselves, hey, listen, I can grow up and be a fireman. What, do you look like? what I wanted to do is to give uh, the community a voice through photograph, through photography. And because it's often said that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And then, but you can interpret a photograph almost any way you want, okay? Uh, and the more immediate uh, that the 
photograph has an impact on you, it says something. I work in, in a very diverse range of mediums, you know, copper etching, clay to latex to plaster casting, painting, musical instruments, audio recording, record cutting. Different processes have different qualities that I can't achieve otherwise. I've been living in New York for just about seven years now. It's slow going, you know, New York especially is, is a very difficult place for an up and coming artist. One of my greatest fears is seeing really talented people with lots of potential veer off that course where their day jobs become their jobs and being an artist becomes a hobby. My name is Zee Chun and I'm the founder of Uprise Art. We're an arts collectors club focused on providing an online platform for artists to connect to new collectors. Our collectors pay $50 per piece per month to have the piece in their homes and if they decide to buy the piece, all of those subscription fees go off the purchase price. So they're investing slowly instead of having to commit to a piece right away. Right now, if you wanted to purchase contemporary fine art, you'd go to a gallery to find the time to go to a gallery, navigate that entire scene, find the piece that you like, and make that big financial commitment. Our collectors select artwork online, and we hand deliver and professionally install custom framed works for them. So they click online, and it's in their apartments within a couple of days. The Uprise model allows artists to show work before their next big gallery show. And they're not waiting for the next sale in order to get paid. Artists are compensated monthly. And similarly for collectors, they're not waiting until their next bonus or until you know, 10 years down the line when they feel comfortable enough to purchase artwork before they start collecting. So this is new? This is a new piece, and that's for another show, a Western. Z had gone to see a show that I had done, and she sent me an email and at first I was a little weary, you know, about this, about the internet business and I've seen these and was never really that interested in them. But she talked about it, I really liked the business plan that she had. To me, Uprise is a way to attract young collectors to emerging artists. It feels like less of a commitment, you know, it's all of a sudden not like paying your life savings for a piece that you like, it's slowly paying it off. And I think that's a really reasonable way to purchase something. It's been good. It's, you know, a few pieces of mine are out there and the artists get these monthly checks. And that's another great thing. Like every month, it's like, all right, cool. I'm getting something coming in. I went to school in New York City and I realized that I had these two groups of friends. There were people who were very busy, really focused on their careers in finance or in law school or in business school. And they are always complaining about, you know, I work really late and I come home and my apartment's such a cookie cutter, you know, corporate apartment. And then my other group of friends who are these talented, motivated artists who were trying to get their work in front of pretty much that other group of people. And I thought that there had to be a better way than this whole kind of roundabout gallery model. There's a lot of value in galleries and in specialists who work at these galleries, but the current gallery model also does separate the artists and the collectors to a certain degree. And with Uprise, what I aim to do is to bring the artists and collectors closer together. Sometimes I'll bring collectors to artist studios to do studio visits. The times that you get to meet the person buying your art, I think are much more impactful and, and you get to see what kind of person is actually enjoying your work. You know, when, when you just blindly are selling it, you know, it's sort of like sending your child off into the wilderness. You, know, you want to know where it's going. You want to know it's going to a good home. I like how Uprise is encouraging, you know, young people, young professionals to 
have art in their house, to have art around them, and, and it really does affect your daily life. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.